Mike, do you have an opening worked out for this? Uh, I was going to pull one out my butthole right now. Oh. Kind of like Gru's movies. <laughs> yeah. Let's hear it. Exactly. Uh, all right. Hello and welcome to B Movie Mania presents B Movie Book Club Book Documentary Series Digital Analog B Movie Mania. Welcome. Take two. Okay. <laughs> welcome and hello to B Movie Mania presents the Book Club Extraordinary Documentary Series Book Book Club by B Movie Mania. The, what what book? Wait, was this a book? Do you want me to do it again? Take three. <laughs> There's no <laughs> books involved. What are you doing? Hello and welcome to B Movie Mania presents the Book Club Extravaganza Time Fun with the Boys Maniacs <sighs> B Movie Podcasts. You know, you know what's great about this though is that you would be a shoe in. You'd be definitely hired to be an elf in one of Stephen Drew's elf movies. Perfect. Let's go. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to B-Movie Mania, special Thursday release episode, a uh, little preview of what's coming up for you on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. We uh, we watched a documentary about the filmmaker, about the, 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 the movie we're going to talk about, we, or, or we did talk, whatever, it's happening on Tuesday, tune in. With me, <laughs> as always, are, are my loving friends, uh, Paul Brooks. Hello. <coughs> Hello. Uh, Jason Holes. Hello! <laughs> and <laughs> crazy Chris Hudson. And hello to you too. What is it? What are oh. we doing? What is this? Well, it sounds like you're all doing your elf impressions. Yeah, that was an elf. I don't know. I was playing the part of crazy elf Hudson. I was speaking elf. You, you guys are doing great. You could be in the movie we, we talk about coming up. What movie? Oh, oh, uh, The Unexpected Race. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the documentary about it, which is also how I found out about this filmmaker, Mr. Stephen Grew. It's surprising that no one has heard of this guy before now. It is baffling. None of us have, yeah. The, this, this documentary is called The Insufferable Grew, and you can find it on Tubi or Amazon or Sling TV, I guess. I don't know, it's all over the place. Who's on Sling? I don't know. Some, <laughs> someone. Maya Rudolph. Maya Rudolph <laughs> is hanging out at the Sling headquarters, a.k.a. her home. Yes. She's CEO of Sling TV. Uh, congrats, Maya. You deserve uh, it. Guys, guys, I, uh, I just want to, I just have to interrupt and I just want to say I do not get that reference. No. Oh. Well, Maya Rudolph is the spokesperson, Chris, for Sling. She likes to sit on her couch and, quote, sling her shows. Oh, oh, good. Okay, cool. Ron Swanson was the spokesman for a while. Yeah. I'm glad we're talking about this about instead this. of the documentary <laughs> we watched about the unexpected race. The Insufferable Gru. Directed by Scott Christopherson and produced by Jared Hesh, Jared Harris, and Eric Robertson, the film follows the work of Utah filmmaker Stephen Gru as he creates the film The Unexpected Race and seeks to have Jack Black play a role in his film. There we go. I got it out, you fuckers. You couldn't stop me that time. So, but we, we should point out that this is a remake of The Unexpected Race from 2003. The documentary is about the making of the remake. We are actually reviewing the original 2003 film, so there's a lot of different pieces to this puzzle here. This is already confusing to anyone who's listening, and please hang in there. <laughs> but yeah, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, Paul, you're doing a good job clarifying. I'm just telling the listener here, hang in there. It won't make any more sense, but it'll be worth it. Right. All right. Paul. What? What, did, what, what is this documentary? This documentary is a glimpse into the life of Stephen Grew. And it basically chronicles sort of the production meeting for doing this movie all the way through the premiere. So it basically chronicles the making of this movie Mm -hmm. and all of the people who are, you know, helping, uh, helping Gru out along the way. Most of them unpaid, uh, some of them Jack Black. 
<laughs> uh, Chris, would you say that this film kind of gives you a pretty good idea about who the filmmaker Stephen Grew is? Yes. Great answer. Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jay, would would you say that the film has a good story arc? The documentary has a good arc uh, to follow. Sure, it's a very well constructed documentary. Yeah, I love it. I love hearing all these answers you guys have given me. Now let's get to the meat of it, <laughs> Paul. Yeah. Now I already gave you a good one before, Paul. Oh, I want something meaty. Fine. Who is Stephen Grew? <laughs> that can take the rest of the night, Mike. No, nope. good. We only got a couple minutes. Well, this is what's interesting, because I watched the Unexpected Race, and then you know you kind of talked about this documentary, and we said let's do a little supplemental episode about it. So I watched the documentary after I had seen the original uh, film but before I had seen the remake, so sort of in this weird middle zone. Mm -hmm. And this documentary really has an effect on your opinion of not just Stephen Grew himself, but of his, of his films. This is a situation where it's hard to separate the art from the artist. Bottom line, I don't think he comes across as being a very sympathetic character in this film. Hmm. Okay. But so I'm going to move over to Chris. Paul, I love what you said, but you didn't answer the question. We got to get that question answered. Oh, Chris, <laughs> who is Stephen Grew? Stephen Grew, as my mom once told me, is a filmmaker <laughs> uh -oh. from Utah who cranks out extremely low budget movies, quote unquote movies. Um, stating at one point he has done almost 200 movies, I believe, at least 180, and he makes them on the backs of those willing to donate their time to the genius, the man, the visionary, the auteur <laughs> that is Stephen Grew. Your mom had a really great way of putting that. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, my, my mom was very, my mother was a very eloquent woman. Yeah. I don't, I, my words do not do justice to what she said. So told far, me. so good. Nothing wrong with any of that. Right, right. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jason Holes himself has done the very same. Made films on, based on the back of people who... Have donated their time. It's true. It's true. I well, have. that's true. I think there's a difference between someone like me or other people and Gru. I think there's some things that set us apart. Well, you always seemed genuinely appreciative. I was, you know, yes, I, I to this day, I am genuinely appreciative. Yeah. And I think, Mike, if I may... Um, one thing that you can say about Gru, a, a, a vivid quality, is his narcissism. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the problem, and the, to, to tie together what Chris and Paul were saying, he doesn't come across very sympathetic because he exudes narcissism. He has this auteur-like thing where you never question the director and everything, it's all about him and mm -hmm. he kind of abuses the people that work for free for him. Oh yeah. Thinks he's a big shot. Yep. He thinks he's a big shot and he's got his processes down <clears throat> when it's really, I, I don't think deserved. I don't think he's a legend in his own mind and he acts that way. You don't think that's a little sad maybe? <laughs> Yeah, it is, because the people who pay for it the most are his family. It's true. Um, and yeah. they go into that at length in the documentary about the hardship that his family lives with, and they're just hoping that he gets the unexpected race made with Jack Black and can sell it for, like, a million bucks. And it's like, dude, if you did any research, you'd know that that is rare. Yeah. Super, he's, super rare. He, he's trying. He's looking for a lottery ticket. Right. And, and so I think he doesn't come across sympathetic just because of the way of the interactions with his family and how he treats the people around him. Well, let's mm -hmm. let's let's get a little more specific into that, because it would be one thing if he was making all these supposedly hundreds of movies and he was actually making some money off of them and able to support his family. But based on everything that we learn in the documentary, that's not the case. He hasn't made any money 
off of these movies and his family. What does he have? Th- two or three kids? Yeah, three, I think. Uh, at least yeah. three, yeah. Three or four. So they are getting by on like $1,000 a week while he goes out into the forest and, you know, dresses as an elf and is a, and he's barely able to put food on the table. I'm sure well, I that... I thought it was way less than that. I thought it was like 1000 a month or something. Crazy. It might have been 1000 a month, yeah. Yeah, yeah and the, the place that they live in, for a while in the documentary at least, was donated by his wife's parents, so they don't have any rent. Yeah, it's... It, I think one of the, the, the more poignant moments and heavy moments in the documentary is when they were they talk to the kids a few times and and these kids are what the oldest ones what 10 mm-hmm. maybe and like they're talking to these kids like sitting out on the front just by themselves without the the parents around and they ask you know that's how they like it and they like their dad you know they, they think it's great they think the movies are cool but they ask something and they, they, one of the kids just goes I wish we made more money and stuff like yeah. that. It's just so heavy that that moment of just feeling the kids are part of the financial situation. It seems like the family really does love each other. It seems like he loves his kids. It seems like his kids love him. So I don't want to make it seem like he's a a bad guy. Sure, but um, I think there's a really fine line between Jay. You what you said it best. Why don't you say it? Um, it's a quote, and I, I apologize, I'm, I can't remember the source, but the quote is, um, suffering for your art is noble, making your family suffer for your art is bullshit. <laughs> right. And that's exactly yeah. what he's doing. Yep. He is the poster child for this. Yeah. And he talks about how he's tried to get a job, and he's gone through, the I think, the police academy, and he's tried to become a paramedic, and all of these things, like, none of these career paths pan out, but... Uh, you're getting that part of the story only from Gru himself. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, dude, if you wanted to get a job bad enough, I feel like over time, because we're talking about years, something would happen. Like, I feel like it's, it's he's definitely putting more focus on getting this film thing going than putting food on the table. I think he's putting all of his focus on that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's accurate, yes. Yeah, he, I, Jay, you, you hit right the EMT thing. He supposedly he was an EMT for a bit, so I don't mm-hmm. know how that pound out who got rid of who or who left what. But like that's that's a substantial thing you can do, and sometimes it does suck to stick with the job. But sometimes you just gotta fucking do it, man. <laughs> well, yeah. Look, I mean, right. there's a happy medium here. Like, yeah, you don't have to make 150 movies a year. You can work a job. Support your family. Yeah. Make some movies on the weekends. If he made one film a year, he would be doing leaps and bounds more than most people ever do. Well, and, and the thing about he, a lot of the stuff that he makes seems to be like Marvel ripoffs or Resident Evil. They're just like fan films and stuff. And I'm sure he's counting that as some of the film in his his number. You know, his number yeah, but of films like a done. lot of it is but, stuff that he wouldn't even be able to sell because he's just. Yeah. Par- it's a like he's doing parodies of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nothing wrong with fan films, but he's that's a lot of what he seems to be doing, at least according to IMDb. And you can't make money off that. Well, Mike, no. what was your take on this? Because uh, you are pretty notorious for not being a, a, a very big fan of filmmakers who have big egos and are very mm. narcissistic in this same way. I won't mention any names. Tommy was out. <laughs> well, well, no, that's not my problem with Tommy Wiseau, because I do love Neil Breen, and he is uh, definitely that, too. Uh, well, I have a point about that, Mike. I want to, after your point, I, I have this theory I want to run past you about okay. Tommy, Breen, and Gru. Okay. Uh, well, here's my take on the because I feel the same way uh, in a way, but I, I, I suspect something and maybe, and I don't know, I have no idea if this is legit or not, but I kind of feel like maybe the narcissism is, is possibly something else. What do you mean? I mean, like, and I don't know, but I maybe, maybe there's somewhere on the spectrum situation as I think people put it. Oh, like he's, he, this is just the way his brain does work, and maybe it doesn't work other ways without that could help. be, yeah. And I, you know, I, I don't know, but the Marvel stuff really, the, all the 
the the parody and 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 other people's properties stuff kind of gives me sort of a a, a childish feel to it. Right. And definitely. And a lot of other stuff that's going in with the way he 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 I mean just does music redoes his own versions of music videos and Nickelback. And just uh, is and, and the narcissism in there. The, the 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 focus on this is what's in my head. This is what I have to do. It has to be this way. It has to be this way. Uh, yeah, kind of, kind of makes me think maybe, maybe there's something else going on there too. Um, you know, that's that's an interesting point because Jared Hess at one point in the documentary, I think toward the end, says, "I can't think of anybody else who needs filmmaking to like cope and exist more mm-hmm. than Stephen Gru does." So, to your point, if that's the case, and 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 Jared Hess knows a little bit more than we do. That what that statement kind of supports the idea that that you're saying. You know, yeah, possibly. I, yeah. I cannot wait for the psychoanalysis of Charles Band. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the big things that I wanted to talk about, though, because uh, Jared Hess is one of the producers on this film. Uh, mm-hmm. Listeners, you might know him as the director of uh, Napoleon Dynamite, and he's done several other things since then. He did. Um, didn't he do uh, Gentleman Broncos? Gentleman Broncos, Nacho Libre. I thought yeah. Nacho Libre, yep. yeah. The so, Postal so, Service's third music video. Okay, great. <laughs> so fairly well-established director, and I love Napoleon Dynamite, so I really enjoy his work, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm really curious what he must have been thinking after this documentary came out. Because in the film, he's talking about how he was a really big fan of Gru from the time that he was going to college and then sort of befriended him at some point. But when you come out of this documentary, it's really hard to not have your opinion of this guy change. And I, and I, and I wonder what what he thought of the whole thing. Well, that's kind of what I wanted to get into with Jack Black also. Like, Jack Black's reasons for being in this movie. Like, is did he really want to be part of this movie? Or did he want to just experience the Gru experience? I think that's kind of what they yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> Jared so. says he wants the full Gru experience. He's like, don't hold back on directing him. Yeah. Right. And Steven's like, oh, I will. I, I'll, I'll give it to him. Yeah. I think may, a lot of it might be, le, yeah, I, I want to be in a Gru. I, fuck it. It's going to, if nothing else, it's going to be a story. Let's see what yeah. this, yeah. what art comes out of me as a brush, you know, yeah. kind of a yeah. thing. And that's fine, but it's, the whole thing is just weird. I mean, like. Jack Black is trying to do this sort of, like, funny southern accent cop thing. And, like, (laughs) works fine in terms of watching the documentary, but I didn't think that it worked in the actual movie at all. I thought it it was so strange. (laughs) I thought it was so good in the movie. (laughs) (sighs) It just felt like he was there to, like, be Jack Black and ham it up, which is basically what they say in the the documentary, you know? We got to bring that Jack Black sort of comedy and... Ah, it was just a weird vibe. Uh, well, I mean, we don't, we're not going to get into the actual remake, but uh, Paul, wasn't the whole movie kind of a weird vibe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole remake is just not even really worth your yeah. your time. Uh, Jay, what was your uh, theory that you wanted to talk about? Uh, well, okay, so we we talked about how narcissism um, is a trait of Gru, and we're going to assume for the sake of this conversation that there is not a spectrum issue at play here, Um, and we're just going to assume he's a bit of a narcissist. Um, You also can see those qualities in Neil Breen and Tommy Wiseau. It's out there, I think. It's it's documented that they, they conduct themselves similar to Gru. So I'm not saying... I just... I want to ask a question, I guess. To what extent... Is that self-absorption required to do the kind of cult movies that they produce? Hmm. Oh. Or is it? Is it not? Huh. That's a good question. I don't know that it... I wouldn't say that it is necessary. I think I could probably name some filmmakers who have made some great B-movies or great cult movies that are not nearly... um, as into themselves as someone like Tommy Wiseau or Stephen Grew. Probably helps, though. I want to believe that it's not necessary. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it, 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 I think it's a totally different animal we're talking about here. You're talking about good B-movies, Paul. 
Uh, and, and all of us are, obviously. That's what we love. But you don't go to watch a Neil Breen movie to go see a good B movie. You go to see a Neil Breen movie. True. You want to see his his idea brought to screen. You want to see Tommy Wiseau's idea brought to screen. You want to see Gru's idea brought to the YouTube channel. You know? Uh, it's, see, here's the interesting just thing about that, though. What it is. Like, I would say that Neil Breen, out of the three that we're talking about right now, Neil probably has the best brand. Like, oh yeah, you know, every time mm-hmm. you get into one of his movies, it's going to be a wild ride. Tommy had the room. Tommy hasn't really done anything that comes close to entertaining since the room. <laughs> I, yeah. I enjoyed his his TV series about the Ugh. <laughs> the neighbors. <laughs> neighbors, yeah, I I liked that more than I liked the room. Unwatch. What are you talking about? It's unwatchable. <laughs> That's oh my rough. God! You know, by like episode three, I was like, "Yeah, you know, this is this is like Stockholm syndrome. This is all right." <laughs> well, that's, well, that's how I feel going down my Gru rabbit hole and Utah, Utah Wolf Productions. Just <laughs> yeah, I mean, so h- how many of his movies have you actually watched, Mike? I mean, if we're call- if we're using movies in the way we suspect, and that being like the four minute long Star Wars prank nice win video that is him and his family walking around a Smith's grocery store for four minutes uh, in Star Wars outfits, um, then I've probably watched like 20. Wow. God. Wow. No, that's not what we're talking about. Oh. You mean <laughs> uh, f- feature length films? Well, he. I mean, doesn't he supposedly have like 200 of these feature films where where are they well pretty sure he's counting uh uh the joker show number two in which in which he dresses up as the joker talks to harley quinn and then for some reason a batman and bat woman uh thing jumps into gotham and they fight the joker and harley quinn i Great. think th- those are nice. part of it i'm not certain but I'm almost positive those are counted as the 200 films. <laughs> well, okay, fine. But, so, you know, if he wants to count his little side projects and things like that, I have no problem with that. But the frustration for me really does come from the fact that when I watched uh, The Unexpected Race, mm-hmm. I really enjoyed it. When I started watching um, Insufferable Gru, you know, they show clips from all his different movies and all the different types of projects that he's done. I'm starting to think to myself, like, oh, my God, I'm going to, like, see all of these movies. Like, this is going to be my next, like, big thing that I'm going to get really into. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, like, really shocked and and disappointed by the end of the documentary that I had been so turned off by the things that happened in the documentary that I didn't didn't really want to do that anymore. I didn't want to go out and watch any more of his movies. You know, Paul, when I was started watching the documentary... In the very beginning, when I saw all that stuff, before it gets kind of dark, I think I, I texted Mike, and I'm like, if Paul sees this documentary, he's going to move to Provo, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know and why be, you would think that I would want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, no, here, here's the weird thing. I really do like everything that, that I've seen. Like, Mike thought that this was going to be my cup of tea, and he was right. It's the sort of thing that is like the low-budget really bad B-movie that I will watch by myself, you know, in my apartment on a Friday night. But I have trouble separating the art from the artist, and that's just all there is to it. I don't I don't know. I, I wish that it weren't the case in a way, but I can't get past it. Well, let's... I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, and that's, you know, some people are, have it easier than others in, the, in just distancing themselves from that sort of thing. Um... But let's do, why don't we, guys, we got to wrap this up here. The book is almost over. Uh, so uh, let's, let's, why don't we just do some final thoughts on this, if you guys don't mind. I'm sorry it's a little abrupt, but we, we, we've, we've, we've talked a lot about what's going on here. Uh, Jay, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what are your kind of final thoughts on this doc? I think it's a good doc. I think it's a fascinating doc. I don't feel the need to go and watch more grew films for the same reasons that Paul said, but just to see the interesting scenario and who this guy is, I think the documentary is better than any of the films. Um, so I, I would recommend watching that for filmmakers. 
I, I especially if you're a filmmaker. Very fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, crazy Elf Hudson. Well, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the documentary a lot more than I liked the the unexpected race. Um, and it looked like that there are a few other documentaries. I don't think they're by the same crew. I think maybe Gru may have produced them himself. I kind of want to watch those. That's what I got out of this. I haven't heard of that. I may be wrong. I may that may have just been a dream. I don't know. <laughs> Gru flips in and out of my reality. Grusian nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know what to expect. So don't quote me on this. But if there were more. Sure. I'd like to see his trip to Australia to for the Australian premiere of The Unexpected Race and see what those upside-down people think of Jack Black. Mm. <laughs> Mike, what about you? Uh, well, uh, obviously, I think it's... it's I, I, I don't quite have as much trouble separating the artist from the, the art in this scenario here. I, I, I do think it's unfortunate how th- people suffer in the film, but in, in the sense of filmmaking... He is a bit of a narcissist seeming kind of tunnel vision dick, uh, <laughs> uh, but I but I feel that helps with the the simple earnestness of it. Of of this film has to be a certain way, and I am fascinated by that. What no matter what the actual mentality or what it is, I'm fascinated by what comes out on this canvas. And uh, but the documentary, I think, is fascinating. I think it's fantastic. Uh, look at someone who makes small film and puts a, puts their entire life into it. And I would recommend it because uh, you'll come out feeling one of probably two ways. And so <laughs> I think that's uh, great. Uh, Paul, did you have anything you wanted to tack on? Yeah, I got like five minutes that I want to say. Well, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right that uh, it's completely fascinating. I highly recommend checking it out because I think uh, if you watch his movies, this is a great companion piece to go along with that, a little peek behind the curtain. Um, mm-hmm. There's some other great people in the movie that we didn't talk about oh, too yeah, much. Oh, yeah, please do, yes. Um, the director of photography, Lauren, ah, I'm blanking on her last name right now. It's like Vand or something. Yeah. Um, she's basically someone who is like a college student, someone who is trying to get some experience uh, behind the camera and gets on board this project. And there's a real push and pull between her and Steven trying to make this movie. And you really feel for her. Um, Yeah. She's doing everything she can to make this work. And Steven is just not having it. So um, there's an interesting dynamic there. A lot of the other uh, actors who are in the film, you know, they're they're kind of uh, <laughs> it's interesting to watch them, you know, do the best they can within the confines of, of what they're working with. I mean, there's all there's almost a shade of American movie in this entire thing where, sure. you know, it's it's a filmmaker who's very passionate about what he does. It's in a, you know, location that's not Hollywood. It's not big time actors. It's not big time filmmakers by any means, and there's a certain uh, sweetness to that, I guess. So there's definitely a lot to like in this mm-hmm. thing, and I would say that if any anything good could come out of this, I would hope that you know maybe Stephen saw the uh, documentary himself, and maybe just maybe it gave him a pause uh, to say, "Yeah, I need to do things a little bit differently." And if I found out that he had, you know, kind of changed his ways a little bit, start doing things a little bit different on his upcoming projects, that could completely change everything for me. I could turn into a, a pretty big Stephen Grew fan. You might move mm-hmm. out to Provo. I might. It might still happen. <laughs> you know, I think, Paul, you said Mark Mark Borchardt, I think, is the anti Grew. Yep. He's the guy. You just answered the question for me. No, you don't need the narcissism. That's it, oh, right there. I was really hoping there'd be an insufferable Gru two electric Gru blue to change <laughs> Paul's mind. Hey, you oh, never what know. A, what a way to go out! Thank you, listener, for listening to our audio book club docu series uh, about the insufferable Gru. <laughs> There's no books involved. 
Check out the buy our book though. Buy our book. It's called the episode on Tuesday coming out, called, <laughs> where we talk about Stephen Gru's uh, 2003 film, The Unexpected Race, which you can watch on Amazon Prime. Yes, you can. Amazon Prime. You can't watch our episode on Amazon Prime. No, you Wait. can watch the movie. <laughs> oh, the movie. The, yeah, it's on Amazon Prime and stuff. So, and, and, and you could check out, if you just want a small sample of what Stephen Gru's work is like, uh, you can go to Utah Wolf Productions' YouTube channel, and he's got a ton of his stuff up on there. The trailers, some of which there is nothing more than just a trailer, but they're like eight minute long trailers of She Hulk and shit. So check it uh, if you're interested in this like super low budget weird stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I gotta go. So, <laughs> what do you gotta do? I don't know. I gotta go though. Okay. You don't. Uh, <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Peace. Bye. Bye, <laughs> bye Mike. <laughs> I give the insufferable Gru one out of 100. Why didn't Gru lock down his location and get permission to shoot here? Uh, uh, yeah, I give it 74 of those. <laughs> Cut that out.